and, and how, you know, the person, people who have that gift. And one of the things I neglected to do last week was tell you about somebody in this ministry who has that particular gift. And so, as I've done in several occasions, saying, okay, this one stand up because they have this gift, so recognizing them. Well, Providence Donna, would you stand up, please? <laughs> she looked at me like, oh, come on, do I have to? Yes, you have to. <laughs> I understand you were trying to get your scriptures, but just indulge me. So, you know, she has that particular gift. She is a prophet of God uh, in the office of prophet, not just prophecy, but also that gift of discerning of spirits. And, we've and if we don't know what I'm talking about, review the tape last week, and you'll see it's, it's understanding error and truth and so forth and so on, and the spiritual uh, uh, things that's behind it. And as I told you last week, there are spiritual influences behind everything. That doesn't mean we see a demon behind every tree. That's not the issue. But the issue is there are spiritual influences behind everything. So we have to be very careful to not just dismiss something, but understand that there's a spiritual influence. And when somebody has that gift of discerning of spirits, they're able to tell you what kind of spiritual influence is behind what's going on in your life many times. Amen? All right, today we're going to talk about three more um, spiritual gifts. Excuse me, and I've been trying to go this in alphabetical order, so I actually missed one. Uh, so I'm going to include it in this week's. And the first one is going to be celibacy. What? <laughs> celibacy, then encouragement, and exhortation. It's celibacy, encouragement, and exhortation. So uh, the first one is celibacy. You may know it by the name of being a eunuch. And in the Bible, there's a lot of uh, uh, talk about eunuchs in the Old Testament and even in the New Testament. I'm going to give you not Old Testament scripture. I'm going to give you a couple of uh, New Testament scriptures about that. Uh, the, and there's a Greek word that signifies this, and it's, it's pronounced eunokizo. Uh, and that's the Greek word that signifies this whole idea of celibacy. Now, I know we live in a day and age where celibacy is not something that is celebrated, but... It should be. First, let me read a couple of scriptures. Matthew 19, verse 10, 11 and 12. The disciples said to him, Jesus, if the relationship of the man with his wife is like this, and he had talked some things about what the relationship between men and women are, the disciples said, it is better not to marry. Now, I realize some of them were married. Peter, we know specifically was, and a couple others were. But he said to them, not all men can accept the statement, but only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who were born that way from their mother's womb, and they are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men, and they are also eunuchs who made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. He who is able to accept this, let him accept it. So by virtue of that fact that there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom, then obviously there is a gift that goes along with that, or that gifting to be able to be celibate and live a life like that. And I'm going to explain some things about that. The next verse I'm going to read to you is 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 7, 8, and 9. And this is Paul speaking. Paul says, Yet I wish that all men were even as I myself am. However... Each man has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. But I say to the unmarried and to the widows that it is good for them if they remain as, that they remain even as I, being celibate, single. But if they do not have self-control, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. All right? So Paul is saying, I wish that all men were even as I myself am. So he operated as a eunuch or a celibate man. And he says, he says, but however, each man has his own gift from God. One in, so he, he saw that as a gift, which we, that's, that's why we're talking about it, because he saw it as a gift from God to be able to live that type of life. These are things that we don't normally look at in the church and say, that is a gift from God. We don't normally look at that. Um, most people uh, just don't think of it as a gift, but it is, all right? Uh, and there are people who never marry for the kingdom's sake. And that's what Jesus said, and that's what Paul said. But Jesus said they are eunuchs for the sake or they're celibate for the sake of the kingdom. And we don't, I don't think we put a high priority, or maybe that's not the correct word, a, a high value. That's the better word. I don't think we put a high value on those who live for the kingdom never to be married. Now, why, does, why, why is that a gift? 
Well, because one of the things is, I'm a married man, my wife is here, I had two children, and I've got grandsons and so forth, and so you have the cares of the family that does get this part of your lifestyle. You have to take care of your wife, you have to take care of your children, you have to make enough money to, to support them. There's a lot of things you have to do. You have to give time to your wife, you have to give time to your children. Uh, if it was a woman, she has to give time to her husband, she has to give time to her children. We have to give time for those things, and so that's time that is not then time for the kingdom, but it's time for your family. Now, I know big in the church today is this idea of, you know, you know God and, and family, and, and, and God is all about family, and if that means, you know, not doing things for the house of God and not doing things for the church and, and not doing as much, well, that's all right because, you know, God is more concerned about your family and all those kind of things. But historically, and I'm just going to be honest with you, reading Genesis and Revelation, historically, you don't find that there's a big heavy emphasis on this idea that's being presented across pulpits today. The idea and the emphasis is on always serving God. Serving God. And that's why Paul says, and I think we over, kind of overlook these verses a lot of times, and that's what Paul says. Paul says, I would have everybody like me. Why? Because then you can give more time to the kingdom. You can give a lot more time to the kingdom. Amen. Now, one of the things Jesus says is there are those who are celibate or eunuchs from birth. And that simply means there might be something that has happened and they're not able to consummate a marriage and so forth. And in fact, I mean, in, in ancient times, you weren't married until it was consummated. Okay, no matter the ceremony and everything else, you weren't married until it was consummated. So if not being able to consummate, then that literally you weren't, you weren't able to be married. Uh, he said there are some like that who are, who are uh, in that situation from birth. Uh, the, the other one that he said is men. They're eunuchs because of men. And what that simply means is, and you can flesh this out yourself, but what that simply means is uh, those who served in the royal court. Every single person uh, who served in the royal court or served royalty uh, normally were eunuchs. Uh, if uh, a king had uh, multiple wives, he didn't have some virile type guy uh, overseeing his wives. He had a eunuch. Well, well, hey, you know, that was wisdom, you know, because otherwise, who knew what would happen? And uh, I'm sure they learned from that. So they looked for people who, uh, they, who were not married, who didn't have a desire for, you know, sexual relations and so forth. And so they looked for people like that to even serve in the royal court because they were able to get, then give their full time and their full attention to their job or to their service in the royal court rather than have other outside interests and other outside things going on. And so that's, and, and in ancient times, when I say ancient, I mean, that it probably doesn't go back that far. There was, that was, you know, you even go back into, you know, probably two, three hundred years ago, that was still probably the norm, simply because it enabled those individuals to be at the king's beck and call whenever, 24-7. And they didn't have the family ties or the, 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 the things that bound them uh, with, a, with a children and wives and husbands and so forth and so on. But then there are those who are celibate as a gift from God. And it is a gift, and I think it should be a highly valued gift that we value in the, in the church today. Because these are people who are able and can give full service to the kingdom of God without those extra ties. Now... We, here again, in the church, we don't value that, so we have individuals who have a gift and are like that in the church who, because we don't value that gift, don't see themselves as valuable in the ministry. But if we value the gift, and they will see themselves as valuable and many times be able to give a lot more service to the kingdom. Sometimes we find single people, and I'll say single in the sense that uh, who, uh, you know, could give more time to the ministry, could give more time to the things of God, could give a lot more service to the, to the uh, uh, ministry of the Lord, but don't because it's just something that we don't value. We don't see it as a gift, of, as a gift from God. When you have family cares and so forth, you, you, your, your time is taken up. Your time is taken up. I mean, you have to spend some time with your kids. There's no two ways about it. You've got to spend time with your wife or your husband. You've got to do that if you're going to have a, a happy marriage and, and, and raise up proper kids. Otherwise, you know, they, you know it's, 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 
things go by the wayside and all of a sudden things get crazy and next thing you know you're, talk, you're looking at like what, what happened you know and you're getting served divorce papers or whatever or your kids say hey you know you are you know you are deadbeat you don't want that so you have to do those things and that's part of being having a family that's part of being married I'm not I, I hope nobody thinks I'm speaking against all that or you know I'm just simply saying we need to value those who are not married realize that there are people who have this gift and then we, as, as we value them they'll see themselves as valuable and be very useful in the kingdom of God that, that's, that's really all I'm saying is we need to value those folks. We need to make sure that we, understand, we, we encourage them and help them understand. Don't look and say to, to some young lady and say, why aren't you married yet? Maybe that's, maybe, maybe that's not the Lord's plan for her. Maybe that's not the Lord's plan for him, the, the, a young man. So, you know, man, you're 30 years old. Why aren't you married yet? And we think something's wrong. Naturally, in our culture, naturally, if we see someone who's a, 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 you know, older, 30, 40 years or whatever, and not married, we're thinking the worst. We're almost thinking what's wrong with them rather than, hey, man, you know, may, are, are, maybe you have a gift from God for celibacy and, and you know, you can, you can do much more in the kingdom than, than I can. You have greater opportunity. But we don't see it that way many times. We don't view it that way. We're just as bad in the church as the world is. Sometimes even worse. And it's not that, you know, true, true enough, like Paul says, Paul says it's better, better to marry than to burn. So if that's not your gift, then, you know, get married. I mean, just don't marry anybody. Make sure they're a child of God and so forth and so on. Don't just snag some knucklehead off the street. Hey, you're going to get married to me. Well, sometimes we settle. I'm not going to even get into marriage today. That's a whole new thing. But, but you know, sometimes we settle. And we settle for something that's not godly. And then we say, you know, pastor, help. Well, you know, I told you not to marry that knucklehead in the first place. But you just had to get married. Amen. No. <laughs> if, <laughs> if this is your gift being celibate, if this is your gift, then don't let yourself be affected by the criticism and in the windows of people who do not understand what your gift is all about. Because it's so easy. Because we're led to think, why aren't they married? And then you begin to say to yourself, why aren't, what's wrong with me? Why aren't I married? What, what, what's, what's the problem here? What, what's going on? And so then you spend, listen, you spend all your time asking God for a man or a woman rather than spending your time in the service of the Lord. Oh, come on now. See, you spend all, oh, all your time, oh, man, oh, Lord, oh. you spend, you fasting and praying, Lord, send me a man. I, 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 I met, when I first got here, I met some lady. She's actually a pastor's wife but they only been married a, a, a short time, uh, but she's older. And uh, she told me, she said, yeah, I spent, listen to this, I spent 15 years praying for this man. That's a waste of time. Why didn't you spend 15 years serving God with all your heart and all your might? Because I'm convinced of this one thing for sure. I am totally convinced of this. If you put all your efforts into God, God is going to bless you and make a way for you and bring to you everything you need because he knows what you need. He knows what you need. See, too often we don't realize, we ourselves don't realize what we need. We think we know. We act like we know. But we don't know what we need. But God knows what we need. So if I spend my time, listen, if I spend my time putting everything I have, everything I am into the service of the Lord, don't you think that God's going to reward you for your diligence? Don't you think he's going to be there for you and say, hey, listen, that, have you considered my servant? Yeah, Job was a married man with a bunch of kids, and yet God said, have you considered my servant? 
How much more would he say about you when you put all your service into serving God, everything you are into serving the Lord? And the reason, listen, the reason we don't do that is because we look at it from the church point of view, we look at it as what's wrong with them? And we don't see it as a gift, and so we don't value. We don't value being celibate. We don't value that. Even in the church, we talk about purity rights and, what is it, not purity rights, but purity pledges. I'm sorry, I said it wrong. Purity pledges and all those things, and that's great, that's fine. I think our young people should have purity pledges. They ought to pledge to remain pure until they get married. That's a wonderful thing. And until they do get married, we ought to have an avenue or we ought to have a way for them to be, a very, a be very aggressive in the church to do the things of God. Why not? You know that old adage, the uh, uh, idle hands of the devil's workshop? Kind of true. Kind of true. And so many times we don't even have a, a way for people in the church who, who, who are single. I'm not just talking about who have a gift of celebrity, just single people to be able to pour their heart and soul into the things of God. We say, oh yeah, well do it at home. What about them being here? Having prayer meetings here. Being to help here, doing things here in the, in the house of God. The Bible talks about a woman named Anna. And it says about her that she had been a widow, off the top of my head, I believe it was like 50, 70 years, somewhere along that. She had been married as a young girl. Her husband died shortly thereafter, after a few years, and she was a widow. She probably had not had any children. And the Bible says this about her. Here's somebody who understood what it meant to put their heart and soul into the service of the king. The Bible says about her that she went every day. Every day. Read it. Every day she went to the temple to serve God. Every day. Well, how could she do that? Easy, because she had the time and opportunity. She had been gifted with a life of celibacy. And because of her diligence to serve God, when they brought Jesus to the temple, who did God allow to see him and handle him? This faithful woman who dedicated her life to the service of God. See, you have no idea the reward that comes from giving yourself over to the Lord. You have no idea. Think about she, This was the greatest, think about this. This was the greatest honor. The greatest honor. Then it, the Lord of glory. The king who was to, who was to change the entire world. Jesus changed and turned this world upside down. And she had the honor. Come on now. The honor to be able to hold this precious little baby because she made a decision to serve God with all of her heart, with all of her might, with everything she had. She made that decision. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? But we don't value that kind of life in the church today. We don't value it because the world doesn't value it. And since the, 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 the philosophies and, and, and so forth, the lifestyles of the world bleed so quickly into the church, bleed so rapidly into the church, we then become just like them. And so when we see somebody who's not married and they're 30 or 40 or 50 years old, we say, what's wrong with them? Rather than recognizing maybe, maybe God has given them a gift that, a gift that maybe I could not handle. Think about your own self. 
It does take a special person to handle that gift. And we should value it in the church. Come on now. We can't allow the world's ideas and philosophies to taint our view. And for those who are single, even, even if at some point you know that, oh, well, you know, God has a, somebody for me, then that's great. But you know something? Until then, until then, pour yourself into the service of the king. Pour yourself into the service, into the service of God. You may say, well, pastor, we don't have, you know, we don't have too many. I, I mean, I don't know what to do. Then you know something? You can come talk to Pastor Martha or me, and you can say, hey, you know, or, or Prophet Donna. He can say, hey, you know, I like, or send an email. I like to, I, I heard pastor talk about that. I'm single. I want to pour myself into the service of the Lord. Trust me, we've got things for you to do. <laughs> Trust me. I, I just want to come over to church and pray. Yes. Two or three of us got together and we're single. We just want to serve God. We want to come every day at noon or every day at six o'clock. Yes! Who knows how, how the power of God will flow because of your willingness to serve and pour yourself into the service of God. See, most of us just look at me, the pastor, and say, well, pastor, you know... You got it's your responsibility to make sure the, the power and the flow and Holy Ghost and no, it's all of us. It's every single one of us. There was a pastor, yeah, the toes, the feet, the arms, the head, the leg, the eyelashes, every part of us. There was a pastor in his church. He was preaching and, and uh, uh, preaching in his church and. And, and, and so the people that doing his message, he's preaching, and the people heard the, the, these voices. And they, they heard these voices, and they turned to each other. To, and finally the pastor stopped and said, don't mind them. They're down in the basement praying for me, praying for this word to go forth, that you receive it and hear it. They are the special intercessory team that sits down there and prays and calls on the name of the Lord and brings down by the prayer the Holy Ghost in this place so you can receive. See, that's what we need, people like that. I'm not just talking about painting the wall or, or vacuuming the floor. I'm talking about people who are willing and say, I don't know to do too much, but I know how to pray. I know how to say, oh God, And you can do that when you're single. You have a lot more ability to do that than when you're even married. I believe that if we use this gift as intended by giving time to the kingdom and taking care of God's business, then you see God will take care of your business. There won't be any question about if he has a husband or wife for you that they will come up on the scene. And that'd be the perfect person that God has for you. No doubt in my heart and my mind. No doubt. Because otherwise, what are you sitting up doing? Watching TV at night? Playing on your phone? Amen. So let's begin to value this gift. Amen. Let's, now, let's move on to encouragement and exhortation. I'm going to put these two together. Encouragement and exhortation. And I believe these two gifts are closely related, so I'm going to talk about them together. Encouragement is uh, parakaleo, and exhortation, these are the Greek words, is par, uh, paraklesis. I'm going to just remember the pronunciation, par, paraklesis. And so, as you can see, in the two Greek words, they're very similar, very, because the, the, the root is, is pretty much the same. Uh, exhortation, as a definition, is an utterance, discourse, or address conveying urgent advice or recommendations. I'll say it again. Exhortation is an utterance, discourse, or address, verbal address, conveying urgent advice or recommendations. Encouragement means to inspire with courage, spirit, or confidence, to promote, to advance, 
So to inspire with courage, to inspire with spirit, to inspire with confidence. So we, we, we look to encourage people. We look to exhort folks. Why? Because you need to have some confidence about you. You need to understand that there are urgent recommendations that come from God that we need to jump on that bandwagon. You need to have a spirit about you that is ready to go, 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 go. Romans 12, 8. Let's see, I got an amen back there. Thank you, child. See, the Lord knows if you don't say amen, he knows how to make a child say amen. They may not say amen, but they're just like, hey, hey. <laughs> and in translation from baby talk, that's amen, pastor. Preach it, preach it, and keep on preaching it. <laughs> All right, Romans 12, 8 says this. He who exhorts in his exhortation, it's talking about the gifts, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Romans 12, 8. Hebrews 10, 25. Not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Hebrews 3.13 but encourage one another day after day as long as it is still called today so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. We are to encourage one another. We are to exhort one another. There's a gift of exhortation, all right? The gift of encouragement. 1 Timothy 4.13, until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and teaching. So part of the, the, the whole preaching and public ex, uh, 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 recitation of uh, the scriptures is to encourage you, to exhort you to good works, to exhort you to do the things that God would have you to do. And finally, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 3. But one who prophesies speaks to men for edification and exhortation and consolation or comfort. So edification and exhortation and some of your Bibles say comfort or consolation so this is so exhortation and encouragement are very close together and listen I'm going to be just blunt and honest with you we don't encourage or exhort each other enough in the church I know that because I see so many people with attitudes in the church come on now y'all would have been jumping on your feet with a handkerchief waving it saying yes pastor you're so right some of y'all to be saying, yes, pastor, that's me, and running up to the altar and repent. And there's too many of us who cannot take encouragement. Oh. Now, you guys know I'm straight, no chaser. I'm like alcohol. Don't cut it with nothing. Just give it to me straight. You want to give me some Hennessy? Fill it up. I don't need nothing to cut it. Because I want the full effect. Huh? That's me. Straight, no chaser. Ain't no, I'm giving you, I'm going to give you the full effect. You know, I tried. I'll be honest with you. I, I'll be honest with you. I tried to be that kind of pastor that just, you know, just said things in a roundabout way. That, I, I can't do that, Galvesto. It's just, it's just hard. I, I can't do it. I got to just tell you straight up. You know Why? Because your life depends on it. Your soul depends on it. Your destination depends on it. I've just got to tell you straight up what's going on and what's happening. I can't hold back. Because if I hold back, then God's going to put that on my charge. And I'm not about to get charged with your foolishness. Come on now. The church needs encouragement and exhortation. Because there are two, and I, and I wrote down here two, not like T-O, but T-O-O. -O. I should have added about ten O's. Too many people in the church who declare that we're not able to do the things of God that God has declared for us to do. So we're not able because we, we don't have the money. We don't have the manpower. We don't have this. We don't have that. Listen, I firmly believe if we just start out doing what God has called us to do, then he's going to add the money. He's going to add the manpower. He's going to open the door. He's going to make the way. He's going to make the mountain fall down. He's going to make the valley get filled up. He's going to make the road straight for us. He's going to do that if we just start out. We're not able to overcome like the Lord said. I don't know what's wrong. Why can't we overcome? We haven't overcome because we haven't started. 
You can't overcome sitting down. You can't be an overcomer just sitting around like, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, oh, well, what we're going to. No, no. You overcome by getting out there and engaging the enemy. You engage what's going on out there. You deal with it. And you don't, and, and you don't, Nammy Pammy. I, oh, my Lord, I'm going to be honest with you. But the thing that bothers me the worst, pastors bother me the worst, to be honest with you. And the pa- type of pastors, not all pastors, but the type of pastors who, well, you know, you know, we've got to be cognizant of this and we got to be aware of that and we don't want to hurt nobody's feelings and we got to make sure that we express the love and they, all, they put it all on the love of God. They put it all on the love of God. We got to show the love of the Lord. Well, I, you know, I read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and maybe I read it different than you. When I read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I'm telling you, Jesus, boy, if that, was some, if that was the love of God he was showing, he was a hard man. Jesus did not shuck or jive. He wasn't playing. When the disciples didn't do something right, he would call them, <laughs> he, he'd call them a faithless generation. He said, he said he, one time he told me, he said, have I been with you so long that you still don't get it? What's wrong with you people? Jesus was short, man. He said, oh, if Jesus were my pastor, you wouldn't last long. I don't think I'd last long because after I'd be here, hey, gee, come on, hey, come on, come on, Jesus. You can talk to me better than that. We've, we, we, we've, uh, we've made our pastors palatable. We, they go through seminary and we teach them how to, you know, be, be you know, the, oh, we don't, don't ruffle any feathers, don't do this. And then we wonder why there's such sin rampant in the church. We wonder why all the kind of craziness that's happening in the church happens. I mean, I'm t- this, I, this is no joke. This is real stuff where folks are pulling guns on each other in the church. Shootouts in the church. Folks doing all manner of things in the church. The last building we had in Grand Rapids, when we first moved in there, in the church, because the church had had it previous to us, so it wasn't like this was somebody else. This was in the church. We found several items that were, needless to say, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Deplorable. That's a good one. That's a good one. Some things in the pastor's office. In a bathroom, we found condoms in the ceiling. All manner of things were happening. Because, see, we just turn and look away. We turn and look away. We don't want to deal. See, and, and, and one of the things that happens is people aren't able to take encouragement. That's what do you mean by that? We're not able to take encouragement. And what I simply mean is, when somebody comes and says, hey, you can do it. Oh, I'm not able to do that. We act like it's a badge of honor to say, I can't. And for those who know me, the two words I hate the most together are, I can't. Yeah, the other two words is, I won't. I hate those two words together. I can't and I won't. Because what you're telling me is, no matter what God says, no matter what the word of God says, you're just not going to do it. See, if, when I come to you and I say, hey, brother, sister, you need to, you know, you can, you can do this. You, you need to, that's encouragement. That's exhortation. I can tell you the biggest encourager we have in this building. She's sitting right there on the front pew, Sister Donna. She would give her right arm, left arm, both feet, 
both eyes to see you do what's right. Okay, one eye, she said. <laughs> she still got to be able to see out of the other one. Okay, I'll give you that. <laughs> to see you live right. I know that. I've been married to the woman for over 40 years. I've seen her. Seen her in action. She will do whatever it takes to get you to live right. And yet, we've had people over the years who said, no, 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 no. Refuse encouragement. Refuse, refuse, and you say, what, that's not encouraging. Yes, it is, because see, if we're telling you the truth, if we're telling you what's right, if we're encouraging you, live the right life, be the right kind of man, be the right kind of woman, stand right before God. Come on, you can do it. You can do it. And yet people have, I'm, I, over the years that I've pastored, and I've been pastoring since, I actually, I preached my first sermon in 1976. I don't say wow like that's a long time. <laughs> no, I'm just sure. <laughs> Whoa, pastor's ancient. No, I'm not. I'm 25 years old in my head. <laughs> I'm about 35 in my body, but about 25 in my head, okay? <laughs> and so, <laughs> but, but you know, I, I, pastoring, I mean, I, I, I think since about 1980, I've been pastoring straight. <laughs> Amen. And so I've seen them. I've seen people. I've seen their reactions. I've seen what they do. I've seen how they, and so many people are hard to receive encouragement. Just don't want to be encouraged. And we have encouragers and exhorters here to be able to exhort you. When we are having service, when, when Sheila's up here, she's exhorting you. Come on, let's lift our hands and praise the Lord. That's exhortation. When Sister Martha gets up at the podium and, and says, Come on, let's give the Lord a shout. That's exhortation. When we say, come on, you can do it, you can make it, can't nothing stop us, we're going to do this no matter what, praise God, we can do it. And you said this, hey. So we're trying to give you exhortation. We declare, you can live right, you can do this, this is, this, you're able, because not one of you in here is not able to obey the word of God. Every single one of you uh, is able to obey God's word. But you ought to be able to receive encouragement. To speak well to one another. You want to know something that bothers me? Is when we, in the house of God, treat each other just like the world treats each other. See, that bothers me. Because we're supposed to be above and not beneath. We're supposed to be the head and not the tail. See, we're supposed to be able to have a kind word for one another. We're supposed to be able to speak life to each other. Elder Tony and his group, they, they do that, they do that mind, was it, is it called Speak Life? Is that the name of it? I know there's that Speak Life in, in it, and it's, you know, all through it, Speak Life, Speak Life. But half the time, we're speaking death to each other. I can't stand so-and-so. What's wrong with you? You can't stand another child of God. You can't stand another saint. Something's wrong. See, that's why, that's why I look, you know, and it's even in the present, but in the past mainly, but it's still even in the present when you have churches and, and, and the white saints, I'll use that term, if, if loosely, white saints who look at the black church and the black saints and say, huh, yeah, well, they're, they're, you know, they, they, can't, they can't come worship over here. And I've see, I have seen this, I have seen this, where uh, 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 black saints have went into a white church and the folks get all nervous and, 
what, 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 what's going to happen? You're going to get black by osmosis? Because they show up all of a sudden, you're you going to turn? Where, where, where they, they, you know, or, or, or some people even walk out? What's wrong with people? And yet they say they're saints of God. I love Jesus. Oh, I'm going to heaven. Praise God. I love Jesus. Well, you forget Jesus was a Jew. Huh? What? What? Huh? What? What you talking about? What are you talking about? No, no, it ain't like the picture you see on the, on the walls. Jesus was Jewish. And if you look at that part of the world, all of a sudden you'll see he was a brown man. So if you can't stand me, you can't stand him. Because he's a brown man like me. I like to think he's about my color. <laughs> Paper bag brown. <laughs> now, but you understand my point here. The point is that we all say, oh, I'm say, I'm this, I'm that, and the other. And yet we can't even we can't even deal with our brothers and sisters because of a skin color or because of something that I perceive they said think they said or because of, uh, of, of they, I think they looked at me a certain way we are to deal with each other in kindness we are to deal with each other as, 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 as I, would, I am to speak to you and deal with you as I would my own savior Jesus Christ how would I speak to Jesus I like that song by Mercy Me, I Can Only Imagine. It's a great song, and it's great because he, he's trying to say, I don't even know what I would do when I come before Jesus. Will I dance? Will I fall on my face? Will I be speechless? I don't know, but all I know is I got to see him. We ought to treat each other like we treat Jesus or think we would treat Jesus. Be civil, not have an attitude with each other. Come on, somebody. Well, Pastor, that's just me. Well, let it stop being you. Get a change of attitude. Get a change of heart. Have a change of mind. But you cannot treat one another like the way we've treated each other in the past and think that the Spirit of God is going to be in this place. So I'm telling you here and now, and I'm spitting, <laughs> but I'm telling you here and now, all that over we're going to have a kind word for one another we're going to speak to each other as if that is a king or queen or, or whatever the case may be we're going to speak to them and give each other respect no attitudes we're going to encourage one another and exalt one another. Not look down. We're going to say, hey, yeah, you can do it. You can make it. Come on. We can do this together. We, we can walk this together. And we're going to serve God together, arm in arm. Because see, what you don't realize is this. God has called us on a mission. We're not just a church to be a church. We're not like every other church. I don't know what other churches are doing, but I know this. We have a mission. We have a calling. That means we have to be strong. We have to be courageous. We have to be ready to go out and, 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 and strike at the enemy. We can't wait till he comes to us. We got to go find him and beat him down. But that means we have to be trained. We have to be prayed up. We have to know what the word of God says. And be able to use that word like a sword whenever we need to. That means that you cannot be the weak one. Because if you're the weak one, that's where the, that's where the line will be breached. And don't tell me that's just you. Don't tell me all about, well, you know, you don't know what I've been through. We all got a story. I can get my grandsons up here and have them play the violin while you tell your story. And it'll be a sad one and probably a whole lot of folk would cry, but so what? I guarantee you I got a story worse than yours. Guarantee it. 
You want to talk about not eating? You want, you, want to, you want to talk about beatings? You want to talk about, I can tell you some stories. I can tell you about my life. But I don't live there. I live here. I'm moving forward, not backwards. I've resolved those things with God. And now I'm moving forward to do his work. It's not about me and what I've been through. It's about what God has declared that I am going to do for his kingdom. That's what it's all about. Not about how bad a life I had. It's about how good a life God has given me. It's about how God has brought me through and continues to bring me through. How he's blessed me all the years of my life and always been there for me. Even when I didn't see it. And I am encouraged by it. When David lost all of his family and, every, and all his men lost everything at Ziklag, they, 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 were, they were sad, they were crying, they were, oh my God, what are we going to do? They were ready to stone, they, their leader, they were ready to stone him. And the Bible says David had to encourage himself. And he remembered what God had done for him over and over and over again until he got encouraged. Then he said, Lord, what shall we do? And the Lord says, now that you are set and ready, go get your stuff. Because now you got the right, right mindset. You've been encouraged. You're not sitting around saying, oh, I lost everything. You're going to go get defeated. But if you got the right mindset, hey, God is on our side. And when he did that, he told his men, he said, shut up your crying. Quit whining, and that's what I'm telling you today. Quit whining, quit crying, quit talking about yesterday and what happened yesterday. This is a new day. Quit wallowing. Stand up, be men and women of God. And let's go forth. And let's take the city. Let's go forth and let's beat down the devil. Let's go forth and pull down the strongholds. Let's go forth and destroy the enemy's camp. Let's go forth and get our stuff back. Because that's what God is calling us to do. And be the type of person that can be encouraged. Be the type of person that can say, yes, praise God, yeah, I can do it. Be the type of person when we, somebody comes and says, hey, look, that, that's, you're going wrong that way. Come on, turn this way. Be the type of per person that can take encouragement and say, you know you're right. Bless God. I'm going the way of the Lord. Come on, let's go. Help me. I'll go with you. We'll walk this thing together. Be willing to take encouragement. Because if you can't, all you're going to do is you're going to end up falling by the wayside. That's why so many saints die early. That's why so many have unfulfilled lives. That's why so many never, ever reach the full potential that God has for them. Because they couldn't take encouragement. They had to have a word to say back. They had to be stubborn. They, they had to stand and... Y'all just don't. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Don't want to know. But what I do know is, let's move forward. Let's move forward. I don't care what somebody did to you. I don't care what they said. I don't care. Husbands, that's where you got to deal with your wives. Wives, that's how you got to deal with your husbands. Maybe he's been a class A number one knucklehead. Encourage him. Encourage him. You do that. Let God handle the rest. God will bring him about into the right place. Same thing with the husbands. Maybe your wife is a class A knucklehead. Speak encouragement. Speak the word of God. That's the best encouragement you can have right here. Right here. Right. Stand on this. Stand on this. Smith Wigglesworth's wife did. And he became one of the greatest healing evangelists in the, the last century. 
because his wife stood on this. He, he threw her out in the cold. She still stood on this. Wouldn't let her in the house. He still stood on this. He talked about it. He talked about it because he wanted, you to know, he wanted people to know, see, I was a fool. But then God got hold to me and turned me around. And all she did was encourage him. We need to be able to encourage one another. Encourage. In the house of God, in our relationships, all the way around, encouragement. And then receive encouragement. Don't be hard-headed. You don't know. We're, we're the people of God. We are encourageable. Correction can help, but encouragement can help even more. There's no high hill, but beside some deep valley. If you see a high hill, there's a deep valley beside it. There's no birth without birth pangs. In other words, be able to be encouraged at your lowest point, at the hardest time in your life. Be willing to be encouraged. Receive the exhortation and the encouragement and move forward. And you won't be the weak link. You'll be just as strong as everybody else. And we'll be able to complete our mission. Amen? Let's stand on our feet. Praise God.